Well, tonight, clinical and forensic traumatologist Hanif Benjamin weighs in on the events surrounding the death of Hannah Maturo. He joins us on set. Good evening. Good evening, and thank you for having me. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, Mr. Benjamin, as a clinical and forensic traumatologist, can you help us understand what is unfolding in this case? So right now, there is a, a lot of questions, more questions than answers. And we are seeing a, a, a multi-layer of trauma and information uh, uh, seeping out, one with the most gruesome finding the death um, of Matura, as well as the children, the revelation, the minor child, and the lifelong what seemed to be abuse. And so when you look at all of these things combined, you're, you start to form the, the question in your mind, what really happened at this resident? What has been going on with these people from childhood into early adulthood that has caused or is causing them to, to, to actually be where it is at this stage. As you, you know, as a forensic traumatologist, you, you try to find truth in matters of severe and traumatic situation, especially in the police arena. And so this matter is definitely leading down that road. Now, Mr. Benjamin, um, you know, it was revealed that through the autopsy that, sh that Hannah was shot in her head. Now, what effect would that have on, let's say, her siblings living in that house? Now, that is one of the major concerns for me, especially having been committed, as, as the autopsy said, over seven years ago. And the question as to whether those children were present during that shooting, whether they witnessed, whether they were told about it, and whether they were part of the environment where this trauma occurred, where this child was buried, and also where they play and apparently lived with this child being there. Definitely, if those things are found to be factual, you can imagine the level of trauma that these children would have been going through. Now, one must consider, uh, and I always talk about, you know, uh, Bandura and classical conditioning and whether those actions were used as fair tactics to keep people in line because one must ask the question why so long how so long why was this allowed to go down um, for seven years um, so, so you really want to find out as to what are the effects and that is why right now even though the, the criminal investigation is going on, there must be a psychological forensic investigation as well to look at the mental capacity of all the people involved. Because while you, know, you can arrest one or two, you had a house full of people. And the question now becomes whether or not one or multiple per persons are accountable or whether or not they were victims and if so, to what extent? Was there or were there part of a lifetime of trauma? What type of abuse, if any? What was going on with them? And so we need to begin to ask these forensic questions to ascertain where we are today. So this is not an easy case. This is not a cut and dry case. Even for criminal investigation or forensic investigation. Do you think a similar investigation has to be done into the mind of the alleged perpetrator or the suspect, that person who is a suspect in this matter at this time? I can tell you, uh, um, I, I don't want to say what I have certainty, but I can tell you from a professional perspective, one would want to ascertain the cognitive um, ability of everybody involved. So I, I suspect that a psychiatric assessment might be on the table. I also suspect that clinical interviewing might be on the table because you want to ascertain whether or not cognitive and clinical um, ability is there. Because when you look at the situation, Trinidad and Tobago has called it bizarre. We are all calling it bizarre. It is not normal. And once it enters into that arena of abnormality, we must determine whether the people involved are in fact operating on a cognitive spectrum where they can understand right and or wrong and if they understand right or wrong whether they are culpable being a child and now moving into this state and if they do not understand right or wrong what would have accounted for this and therefore I suspect that some level of clinical and psychiatric interview shall or should take place to help make a determination. 
And you know, what about neighborhood and reporting child abuse, you know, like that community reporting child abuse? Because um, one resident would have said she would have visited the police several times to make a report, and yet the police have no report. I believe the Children's, uh, the children's Authority also said that they had no report. You know, how do communities deal with, with matters like these, with and scenarios like these? This is the interesting part. Um, for so many years, that abuse or alleged abuse would be perpetrated under the nose of neighbors. But one must also consider the environment. Th th that environment is not a place with heavy pedestrian traffic per se, right? But we must also understand the value we place on children. And we're seeing where children continue to be on the other end of the stick that is not so clean when it comes to abuse. It is telling us, and this case is saying to us, that if we don't take a serious look at child abuse, child reporting, and also holding people are accountable when report is not made, then we must understand. We must also understand what happened in the school system, whether or not the children were displaying behaviors that were concerning and alarming, and why the authorities were not called, and if they were in fact called, why nothing was done. So this case from a forensic perspective, has multiple layers and multiple questions must be asked and answered in order for us to move on as a society. Thank you so much, Mr. Benjamin. Let me make sure I have your title correct. Traumatologist and clinical, is it forensic? Yes, clinical and forensic traumatologist. Thank, Thank you, you so much, much um, for that enlightening conversation and dialogue. Thank you for having me.